I'm trying to help a friend of mine. Uh, his sister took his go his girls camping. They, they're very young girls. The oldest is nine. The girl the girls just called in distress. They said that the, the aunt is driving very erratically. We think she's sick. The aunt isn't picking up the cell phone right now. The sister called. She can't talk anymore. There's three kids in the car. They're trying to five. They're trying to locate her. The woman's name is Diane Shula. They just put it out to the post car okay. and see if they could locate her because the 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 woman that's driving the car they think is having a medical emergency because she, she called and then she couldn't talk anymore and she's got five kids in the car. Hello. Everybody, what is doing? What's happening? My name is Riley. I am your host for today. And this, this is episode three of the True Crime Banter podcast. Welcome. Today, we'll be discussing the 2009 Taconic State Parkway tragedy. Some of you may have heard it referred to as there's something wrong with Aunt Diane. But before we get into the story, let's hop into today's bit of banter. And uh, and for today's bit of banter, I just want to wish all of my American listeners what I'm hoping was a safe and happy Thanksgiving. Uh, my fiance and I, we've, well, what? We've completed two fairly successful dinners so far, uh, meaning nobody's gone too far off the deep end and, you know, the turkey gravy, if you're catching my drift. And, uh, and we'll likely be finishing up our third and final Thanksgiving as this episode is being edited, I suppose. Yeah. And, you know, for those 2% of listeners over there in Ireland and Australia, I see y'all over there, I hope your non-Thanksgiving weekend went, uh, went just as well. I think for a lot of us growing up over here in the States, we've always been taught to take this holiday as a, a moment to really reflect and be, be thankful for the lives we have now, uh, despite the, the troubles and hardships you know, that all of us are, are either going through or have gone through. And, and I think it's, it, it's a good time for us to sit back and just be thankful for the family that we still have around you, because you just never know when might be your last moments with them. And I know... I know that uh, that's a bit dark, but hey, it's a true crime podcast. What can you expect? Anyway, uh, today's story covering the tragic accident on New York's Taconic State Parkway. It's a prime example for never knowing what lies just around the bend. The story starts off at Hunter Lake Campground, July of 2009. Dan Schuler, husband of 36-year-old Diane Schuler, wakes up around 6 a.m. He heads down to his boat to finish up a quick last-minute cleaning session. He finishes up around 7 a.m. and makes his way back up to the camper. That is where he wakes up his wife Diane and explains, hey, it's, it, we, it's time to get up. We got a camper to get cleaned up and everything packed away, and we got to do it now if we're going to want to beat traffic on the way home. Now, this is something I can actually really easily relate to. Uh, I'm pretty sure plenty of you out there can relate to as well. When I was younger, it seemed like pretty much, I don't know, every other summer weekend, I guess, we were out camping. Rotating between my dad's side of the family to my mom's side of the family, Back to my dad's side of the family, I have, I have many a, a young, fond, innocent memories of, well, I don't know, joking around the campfire, or possibly watching my brother crash the family friend's dirt bike into a ditch, and a uh, beer can chicken cooking on the grill. Yeah, you heard that right. Camping was, and still is, one of those activities where the entire family is together. Away from the stresses of a 6th grade reading test, and all you have to entertain yourself is really what your mind can come up with. It's a little different now with cell phones, but if you're doing it right, camping is a time where people can just come together for a few short nights, tell old stories, and watch the stars for a, a shooting meteor, or you know, what my fiancé likes to claim as an actual UFO that she and her friends saw that no matter what... She's convinced it was something alien-like. I don't know, I digress. 
Back to my point. Camping is an old school way to just get away from your daily stresses of life and as amazing as it feels to be out in nature with people to enjoy it with, that final morning of waking up, knowing just how much stuff you have to get packed up, trying to get ahead of the traffic rush, because God knows everybody and their mom who lives upstate just like you decided to head down south for the weekend the same time that you did. So Daniel, he wakes Diane up. The camper gets cleaned, clothes are packed away, the family dog is loaded into the pickup, and all five of the children are ready to rock and roll in the minivan. Yeah, five children. No, not all theirs. Ranging from ages two to eight years old, there were Diane's three nieces, eight, seven, and five years old, and her and Daniel's two-year-old daughter and five-year-old son. Her son Brian being the only boy surrounded in a van of four girls and his mom. I, I feel like secondhand pain for that. As it made the most sense, uh, Daniel and Diane drove separate vehicles to the campsite. So Diane took her brother's minivan to, you know, fit all the kiddos in, while Daniel, he towed the camper in their own personal pickup truck, and uh, they also had a dog, and the dog rode shotgun. What was meant to be a quick drive home from the campground turned into hours of terror filled with phone calls and rest stops. So having been on these drive homes many a times as a youngin, uh, even most recently again this past summer, that that drive home is never, ever as joyful as the drive to the campground. I mean, you're exhausted. You just got done spending, you know, at least an hour, maybe two hours packing things up. And you know that all you're driving towards is freaking the real world, man, right? With Monday right around the corner, just heading back, knowing that, uh, Vacay's over, baby. It's over. And in Diane's case, uh, she's you know she's got a van full of kids chanting, "We won't make nuggets. We won't make nuggets." <sighs> All right, that was never reported as something that actually happened, but I could imagine a scene similar to that as she pulled the minivan full of kids into a nearby McDonald's to get them all some food. After the stop at the good old Mickey D's, uh, there's security footage of Diane pulling into a nearby gas station. She walks in, asks the clerk something, then walks back out to the van and takes off. So there's no audio in the actual security footage itself, and the, the clerk has declined to speak to investigators regarding what Diane may or may not have actually said. But although the interaction was brief, nothing really seemed to uh, out of sorts, I guess you would say. But it's after this stop that things start to go awry. It's around 11 a.m. when the first of many eyewitnesses, actually, uh, started noticing a red van. The van driven by Diane Schuler was bullying its way down the parkway. Some people reported severe tailgating, while others were reporting her passing cars using the shoulder of the road. So one, one couple actually described a feeling of danger so imminent that the wife was prepared pretty much to be pushed into some sort of accident because of the way that Diane was, I guess, owning the road. Another couple that was actually put in danger because of this erratic driving actually pulled off at the same rest stop as Diane did. The husband was hoping to give her a piece of his mind should he come across her in person, you know, just just so happenstance. Fortunately, or maybe unfortunately, though, he never saw her. It was right around this stop at the rest area that the first of the phone calls were made. Diane had actually called her brother, the father of her three nieces that were in the back seat, to explain basically that, hey, you know, traffic is an SOB, and uh, we're running late. So this was, I don't know, around 11.30 or so in the morning, just to keep the timeline straight. But it is just past this rest stop that uh, other eyewitnesses saw this same red van pulled over to the side of the parkway. Diane was outside of the van, hands on her knees, almost as if she were throwing something up as, uh, as some of them would basically describe it. I could, I could picture it, you know, if you're just not feeling well, you're not going to like 
take a knee on the side of the road and throw up, you're just going to throw up, you know, throw up, throw, okay, anyways, back on track, this is where the story starts to take a turn for the worst. Nearly two hours later, Diane's brother gets another phone call from her, and she's, she's telling her, I'm, I'm not feeling well. You know, she's saying that she's having trouble seeing, and at one point during the conversation, she actually called her brother Dan, the name of her husband. So, you know, as a good brother would, he says, hey, Diane, nope, you stay there, stop driving, I'll be on my way, I'm gonna come help you. After that phone call, uh, a couple more were made. This time, it was Diane's nieces calling anyone that they could for help. I'm trying to help a friend of mine. Uh, his sister took his, go his girls camping. They, they're very young girls. The oldest is nine. The, girl, the girls just called in distress. They said that the, the aunt is driving very erratically. We think she's sick. The aunt isn't picking up the cell phone right now. The sister called. She can't talk anymore. There's three kids in the car. They're trying to, five, they're trying to locate her. The woman's name is Diane Shula. And just put it out to the post car. Okay. And see if they could locate her because the, the, the woman that's driving the car, they think, is having a medical emergency because she, she called and then she couldn't talk anymore. And she's got five kids in the car. So as Diane decided to ignore her brother's advice, uh, it was another call from one of his daughters in the van explaining that dad... There's something wrong with Aunt Diane. So, side note, there is a documentary that HBO did titled exactly that. There's something wrong with Aunt Diane. And if you have an extra couple hours, I do suggest uh, giving that a look. I think you can actually, weirdly, just find it on YouTube and uh, watch it there in like 240p or something. I don't know. It's, it's, it's interesting. And it gives you the opportunity to put real faces and real emotions to the actual family members left reeling with what's about to happen. So investigators are unsure of the exact route taken, but at some point, Diane Schuler took this red minivan, filled with the five children, all eight years old or younger, and entered the wrong direction of the Taconic State Parkway, passing both a do not enter sign and a wrong way sign. So for nearly two miles, Diane Schuler was heading south in the northbound lanes, reaching a speed of what they are estimating is 85 miles per hour, locked dead straight in the northbound passing lane as the oncoming drivers swerved and dodged to avoid the wrong way van. 911 calls started pouring through as everyone knew this was a recipe for disaster. Hey, police 911. Yeah, you got a guy driving south on a northbound Taconic Parkway. He's going like a bat out of hell. Hey, police 911. Hey, police, you got a northbound Taconic. There's a city van in the right lane going southbound. 911. Hi, I'm at the Taconic Expressway. We just passed uh, a hundred exit 100 feet. There's a car going like 70 miles an hour the wrong direction. So that disaster happened as a red minivan slammed head on into an oncoming SUV filled with three men on their way to their own family dinner. Pedestrians pulled to the side as the scene was almost obviously fatal doing everything they could as others continued to call for emergency help. Uh, Diane's body was pulled from the wreck, and the following 911 calls give you a small glimpse of what the wreckage actually looked like. There's like little kids, there's the kids not moving. There's, yeah, there's a whole bunch of kids. Honestly, the car smashed. One emergency. Accident. We're 117. We're 117. What is this? Pleasant Hill Road? That's nine. Ma'am? Hey, guys. Wait a second. I'm just going to... We're 117 at the Connick? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Are there any injuries? Um, I really don't know. Hold on. Let me check it out. Hold on. So as Diane's sister-in-law describes in the previously mentioned, you know, HBO documentary... Uh, the phone calls following the accident were a mess. She remembers telling her husband, so Daniel's brother, that uh, there was a car accident. 
a bad one. And Brian, the five-year-old boy, was gone. He didn't make it. With all the craziness of what just transpired rushing through the veins of everybody affected, there was one small issue. Diane's sister-in-law was wrong. Brian, though severely injured, was pulled from the wreckage and taken to the nearest hospital. However, he was the only survivor. Brian's mother, Diane, his baby sister, his three cousins, all eight years or younger, and all three men in the other SUV, all victims of this one singular crash. Brian was rushed to the hospital alongside one of his cousins, who sadly passed not long after. Whatever the mix-up was, however it happened, the Schuler family was soon informed of the true magnitude of loss in this accident. Eight lives lost, one survivor, and entire families' lives changed forever. So news of this accident spread fairly instantly. I mean, headlines all over the place were searching for the answer to one single question. What was wrong with Aunt Diane? So here is where this story gets, it gets dicey. Here's where the news reporters and the columnists, they, they start to push their agenda, you know, where the, the, the families on both sides fight to defend their own. And, and here's what makes this case so compelling to those who know it. So toxicology reports, they come back after the accident and they show that Diane Schuler not only had a 0.19 blood alcohol level, which is, you know, well over the, you know, double, actually, well over double the legal limit, uh, but she also had traces of THC in her system. Some of the eyewitnesses of the scene of the crash, they, they reported a broken bottle of vodka near the, the driver's side of the minivan and, and it basically was this supporting uh, evidence to the, the, the case being made that Diane Schuler had basically been driving under extreme intoxication. But for those of you who watch the HBO documentary on this case, you'll find that much of that special is dedicated to dispelling any idea that Diane Schuler was some, you know, drunk alcoholic that made one bad decision, costing her her life and the lives of seven others. The documentary is filled with her family and friends, you know, they're, they're talk, they talk about Diane's childhood growing up and how she was the ultimate mother and just always somehow on top of just everything with not a flaw to be seen. Uh, they do talk about how she was having issues with the tooth pain too. Uh, she was always having to have a doctor check it out, I guess, and they were actually suspecting, this is the, the family and friends of Diane Schuler, that maybe in the gas station uh, surveillance footage that she was asking the, the clerk for some sort of high dosage medicine or something more than just like a Tylenol or, I don't know, aspirin. Um, and they, they actually, I will say in, in that HBO document, documentary, uh, they did mention at some point that she was, at least I, I think they did, uh, she was prescribed Ambien, which is a drug as many people know used to help with insomnia and, and people having trouble you know falling asleep at night but for the most part the hbo special does a good job of truly making you wonder what had actually happened during that trip home so the questions they start to arise as you start looking into the details of everything that's transpired I mean, the workers at the McDonald's, they, they had no concern that she was drinking, you know, at the time that she brought the kiddos in to eat their McNuggets. And, and the videotape, again, the videotape of her stopping at the gas station, no signs that she was under any sort of intoxication whatsoever. Now, don't get me wrong. Hey, I get it. Everyone can handle their alcohol differently, right? Some people could be completely plastered and hold a full-on conversation without you noticing one bit, while others can't say one sentence without slurring their words together. I'm going to let you guess uh, which one is me. 
Anyways, watching the security tape from the gas station, in my own opinion, uh, there's really nothing to be alarmed about. And for those of you who choose not to uh, look up the, the surveillance footage afterwards, I'm going to I'll describe it real quick for you. So basically, Diane, she pulls up in the red minivan, parks it at one of the pumps, walks in like five steps, says something to the clerk. He says something back and she just walks back out to the van and proceeds on a route. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know. The the road rage, I guess, the, the bullying people on the parkway, uh, before she gets to the first rest area stop, that, that is a bit concerning. But if I'm telling you, if anybody's like me, <laughs> my my fiance can attest to this. Traffic is one of the very, very few pet peeves that I actually have. And I'm not saying, listen, listen, I'm not saying I would start running people off the road. I don't No, I'm not about that. But you know what I would say if the traffic was occurring? I don't know say on on the way to a restaurant or maybe on the way home i'd say the one phrase that i think most adults have probably said at least once or you know maybe twice in their life yeah, i'd be like uh god you know what i could use a drink the question though is how could a simple road rage lead to an 80 mile per hour trip down the wrong way of a parkway and what could have been going on inside Diane Schuler's head that she was mistaking her brother for her husband over the phone and, and even telling him that, you know, something just wasn't feeling right. So this is the part of the podcast where I, I would like to give you my thoughts and we'll dive real quickly into some of the other more intriguing theory that others have come up with as to what actually happened with Aunt Diane. So one theory suggests that Diane truly did have a drinking problem and that uh, after calling her brother to tell him that she wasn't feeling well and, and, you know, her brother was like, hey, stay put, I'm on my way. Diane, being the world's most, you know, perfect mother in the eyes of her peers, she maybe she felt her world crashing down and that, that maybe wh what's going to happen if she's found out to be an alcoholic. So the idea that, you know, she said, screw it, I'm just going to hurry up and get home and, and hopefully she can keep her drinking problems to herself. But the issue, you know, with that, the main question that arises is that most of the eyewitnesses who called in those those wrong way driver calls, uh, they, they all describe Diane's driving as as almost like a perfectly straight line in the passing lane, just heading in the wrong direction. So no swerving, no drifting. No one side or the other side. It, it, they, you would describe it as a man on a mission straight down the, the passing lane. I, yeah, you get it. So another theory is that uh, similar to that previous one, um, though instead of trying to get home before anyone found out about her problems, Diane Schuler said, you know what? I'm just going to end any possibility of any of my issues coming to light. How would you end it? Well, murder-suicide by driving the wrong way on the parkway, which actually for this theory, it almost matches more the man on a mission type of description because hey, if you are dead set on, uh, you know, fucking killing everybody you're with, including yourself, um, 85 miles per hour head on into somebody who's going to do the job. But here's a, the theory that I've come up with, and it's based on ideas that I've been told or had explained to me, and another idea that I've actually I didn't <laughs> I didn't really think about, or I I should say I started researching upon looking into this case. So let's say, all right, stay with me here. Let's say Diane Schuler is someone who has terrible, terrible road rage. Uh, so you know, dealing with traffic, and she's getting peeved. Yeah. I mean, basically what uh, the eyewitnesses explain. People, you know, running people off the road, passing people on the shoulder. Basically no regard for other people's lives, even though you're, you know, 100% sober. So, yeah, yeah, okay. The The family says the camping trip was all fine and dandy. And maybe, but, you know, maybe Diane was just ready to get back home into her own house. Her own bed, you know, back to her own daily routine. That could 
be, I guess, a reason for this road rage of hers. So the traffic is, you know, setting her off, and, and she decides to go ahead, pull off to the rest area, knowing that there's still a bottle of vodka left over from the camping trip, and she's going to pour herself a drink. Now, I'm not saying uh, this is what we do with our leftover alcohol, but I do know that, hey, anytime we go somewhere and we bring alcohol and, and it's alcohol we're going to be bringing back if it's not all used, then yeah, I just we throw it in a bag and we throw it in the back seat. You know, it does, it's not stowed away somewhere that uh, if the cops were to pull us over, um, I don't know, they'd be able, it, it's it's very easily accessible if we were psychos and decided to drink it while we were driving now i want you to understand i'm I'm not saying that this is the ideal way to cope with stress especially if you've got road rage but uh I, i'm i'm asking you is it that much different than saying hey let's just stop and get a couple of drinks at the restaurant while we wait for traffic to subside i'm uh i'm not so sure so maybe just maybe diane overdid it with the makeshift cocktails all right Maybe, I don't know, she was thinking, let me hurry up, down a couple shots before anybody notices what I'm even doing. And, uh, you know, listen, her family claims that they've never really seen Diane obnoxiously drunk. So so two to three shots could very well get her shwasted. I mean, especially if she's, you know, sizing those shots to be bigger than your your typical uh, shotty shots, you know? So here's the thing, though. The thing with alcohol is that for really for most drugs for that matter um it takes takes some time you know it takes some time for the effects to actually take place you know you don't really realize you're drunk until <laughs> until you realize you're you're drunk like you you, you do something you're like fuck i am fucking fucked up right now you there's no gradual decline into it. it's you know you're feeling good you're having fun and all of a sudden whoa i'm fucked up so, Diane, you know, not knowing, maybe not knowing her limit of alcohol, maybe she had another idea. She said, let me, let me pop one of these Ambien real quick, or maybe she said, I'll take half or like a quarter of an Ambien, and just something to help her calm her mind and, and rid her of this, these, I don't know, road rage demons that she was experiencing. But you know what else uh, calms a stressed mind? The marijuana or weed, or, uh, you know, the stuff that the toxicology report said was found in her system. So, 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 let's, let's follow along here, okay? I don't want to lose you guys. This is my own weird theory that probably isn't right. Uh, just something I like to theorize over. So what if Diane was just trying to relax, okay? Road rage is taking her over. She pulled off to the rest stop and just, what am I going to do? What do I have with me that can just help me relax? So she mixed up a cocktail of drugs, alcohol, and, you know, in doses that she thought was okay for her own personal usage. Uh, but when you start looking into these effects of the, these, the, the effects of alcohol combined with Ambien, you you start to realize that people say they pretty much black out like <laughs> that's about it like in a sense that so their body and their brain are doing things without them mentally being conscious of doing things like they're you can go onto the internet search alcohol it's ambient on, on reddit or something and you're gonna you can read stories of people you're basically sleepwalking through tasks that you shouldn't be able to like sleepwalk through. So I, I think uh, one of the more well-known cases or um, stories of Ambien and what it's capable of is Roseanne Barr. If you guys don't remember uh, Roseanne Barr, she was basically canceled off of that Roseanne show for these racist tweets that she was sending out at like two in the morning. And she basically chalks those up to Ambien and says... You know, she couldn't remember a thing about really tweeting any of it. So, uh, that is, you know, it's no excuse for being racist. But, for putting it out on the internet, uh, I wouldn't be shocked 
that somebody with alcohol and Ambien in their system would do something like Diane did. So could it be that Diane Schuler, she mixed up a concoction to help her cope with her road rage, and, and you know, not long after this weird uh, concoction that she she put together at this rest area, uh, she was actually seen throwing up. So maybe it was like her body was like, yo, what the, the fuck are you putting in me? And, and then after an hour or so, the effects, the full effects, they start kicking in. So when, when her nieces are calling for help, they're calling the police, they're calling family friends, saying that Aunt Diane, she can't see or she can't talk, but, but she's driving in a perfectly straight line down the wrong way of a parkway. Could it have been just a simple tragic mistake that, that she took the off-ramp of the Taconic State Parkway, visually, you know, or hallucinatingly uh, seeing it as an on-ramp during this concoction-induced trip? Which, you know, with this head-on collision being the sad aftermath of it all. We'll never, I guess, truly know, but that's what makes this case so damn intriguing. Anyways, uh, that's all we have for you guys today. I, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed my, my theory at the end there, too. Uh, uh, and if you did... Be sure to follow us on our Instagram at True Crime Banter. Uh, feel free to leave us a, a like or a review on this, depending on which platform you're listening to us on. And if you're listening to us via the YouTube channel, be sure to subscribe. My name is Riley. This has been True Crime Banter, and you'll be hearing from us next time. Take care.